Our second reading today is from the Epistle of the Hebrews. Epistle of Paul to the Hebrews. It's the 11th chapter. It's the 29th to the 12th chapter, the second verse. Hear with me now the word of God. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as if on dry land. But the Egyptians, when attempting to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, received promises, stopped the mountains of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refused to accept release that they might raise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and scourging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering over deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and all these, though well attested by their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had foreseen something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us to run. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. God's blessing be to the reading of his most holy word. The words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. My question to you this morning, in the race of life, who are you running for? What is it that keeps you going in the race of life? You know, a few uh, times a year now, our roads to the church were blocked off by triathletes who are running by us down Bonville Road. I'm sure you've all had to deal with that traffic blocking. But they were biking or after swimming and racing. And if you look at them, You'll see the strain and the agony in their faces. Now compare this, however, to the Xterra World Championship race located in Maui. The race begins with a one-mile ocean swim off the coast of Maui, but then 18 killer miles off-road, uphill, downhill, over dirt paths, dry lava, and tree roots at speeds going 30 miles an hour. Crashes are the norm, and if your bike or your neck isn't broken, you get up and you keep going. The race ends with a 6.7 mile run, first on sand, which is like spring up a scalding escalator, then 400 yards of soft ball size coral. They call it Ankle Snapper Beach. Now, I read this and I asked myself the question, why would anybody do that? What makes somebody do? those things put their health at risk in such a way. But that event put me in mind of another occurrence a few years ago at the Boston Marathon where a woman by the name of Ruiz was thought to have cheated to the point where an NBC reporter stuck a microphone in her face and saying, man, either you're the fastest runner in the world or you are a fraud. Can we talk? Have you ever secretly felt you weren't up to the race you were running in life? Have you ever felt that somehow you've gotten to the wrong place at the wrong time 
And if people could really look inside you and see the struggle that you, you are going through, that they wouldn't speak to you anymore. Or better yet, you have a struggle with other people or relationships. And other people are expecting that you're going to help them find some word of hope and light for their lives. And you just don't feel adequate for the job. You live in constant fear of saying or doing the wrong thing. And when you do, it's surely evidence of the grace of God. And you know it. You know, I think we all struggle with life from time to time. Sometimes we don't feel as well, we don't feel as good, or we don't feel as clean, or as true as we do at other times. We all have high moments and low moments in life. Sometimes when we see the looks of trust or love or expectation that others send our way, whether they're spouses or their children or their employees or their friends, we feel sometimes like frauds, unable to live up to their expectations. And we don't react well to that. When it feels like you're losing control of the situation, where everything's changing on you, you sometimes react with misplaced anger. Sometimes we say violent things, or we do bad things, which are out of place. Or sometimes we get depressed. Sometimes even despair. Well, this morning I hope to give you, and myself, three reminders of some things that may help when it comes like when we stumble and we aren't sure how to get back up. Things we can use instead of inappropriate anger or despair. The past is the first one. Focusing on the present and our precedent model, Jesus. Now throughout scripture you'll find imagery that reflects an athletic competition. It's quite, quite common for various writers to compare our lives with various events in the stadium. But here in, in Hebrews 12, you'll find an image that doesn't occur anywhere else. He refers to a cloud of witnesses. There's a whole lot of people who stood up and kept going in faith. The measure of life is faithfulness, not success. The measure of life is faithfulness, not success. The other interesting thing about this passage is that the authors focus not on the field, but on the stands. And the imagery at this point is of Moses, Jeremiah, Abraham, Sarah, Rahab, Jacob, Gideon, Samson, Jephthah, Samuel. These are all heroes of the faith in the stands. They're cheering us on. Now, Jacob was a liar. His word in Hebrew means deceit, trickster, a man you wouldn't put in your business. And yet, you hear him saying, I know how guilty you sometimes feel. Keep going. Moses is there too saying, I know what it feels like when you think you're inadequate for the job. You don't have the words and you don't have the energy. But you've got to keep going. And the crowd in the stands doesn't end with the Bible. How about the saints and the martyrs? How about Mary and Martha? How about Chrysostom and Augustine? How about Martin Luther and Julian of Norwich? How about John Calvin and John Knox? How about your grandparents? How about your parents? How about your teachers? Or even past ministers? We cannot forget the past. The people who have kept the faith in difficult circumstances. The people who have found the inspiration to keep going when things got tough. Don't forget the past. Because it helps you in the future. Secondly, I think we see this morning about focus in the present. When the writer of Hebrews uses the words looking to Jesus, it doesn't just mean glancing at something, but instead choosing to look directly, to look intently at something in particular. The writer of Hebrews is suggesting we should look at Jesus. 
you know, there once was a king who decided to hold a great race. And all the young men of the kingdom entered, the course uh, began and ended the king's courtyard, and the prize was a bag of gold. And as they ran the race, the runners were surprised that halfway through there was a huge big pile of rocks that was in their way. But they managed to climb over it, they managed to climb around it. Finally, all the runners had crossed the finish line, but still the king did not end the race. Finally, a lone runner stumbled through the gate, and he said, I'm sorry I'm late, O king, but you see, I discovered this pile of rocks in the road. And he held up a bleeding hand, and he said, and I injured myself re re removing them. But O king, and here he held up the other hand underneath, I found this bag of gold. The king said, you have won the race for that one runs best, who makes the way safe for others. That's the reason we keep our eye on Jesus. He has run the race too. You can avoid the places, you can avoid the situations and people that get you into trouble, or cause you to do things that you feel guilty for afterwards, or things that cause you to be angry. Don't set yourself up for failure. For example, we've learned that a two-year-old in tow, things just don't happen as quickly as they used to. And some of us, as the years pass by, we just don't move as quickly. Now, we can do one of two things. We can get annoyed with ourselves, or we can learn to expect fewer accomplishments in a given period of time. Now, another aspect of our choice is to remember that this is your race. This is your race of life. This is your race of faith. The worst thing you can do is look over at someone else's race and envy them, either for their prestige or their apparent ease. Always remember, this is your race, and you go at the temple you set for yourself. The third thing is the divine president, which is Jesus. You know, Hebrews says of Jesus that he can, he can sympathize with our weaknesses because he was like us. He was tempted in all things, but he was without sin. Well, with this fact in mind, we know that the one on whom we focus not only has been there, but I know that by Jesus, understands what we are going through when I bring my struggles and my failures, but he rejoices with me in the successes as well. That's what the incarnation is all about. You know, C.S. Lewis once wrote, God entered time and space on this planet that Jesus might walk our roads as we must be lonely as we must be, be tempted as we must be, and die as we must die. Jesus came not just to keep you from being lonely, but he came to feel loneliness as you know it. Not just to keep you from being afraid, but to know the fear that you feel. Not just to keep you from dying, but to die as you and I must die. There's a wonderful story of the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. A few thousand spectators remained in the Olympic Stadium waiting for the last of the men to finish the 28-mile marathon. Now, an hour earlier, his name was Mamo Bolde of Ethiopia, who had crossed the finish line looking as fresh as when he started out, and all the fans were getting ready to leave. And here, an hour later, a lone runner, John Stephen Akwari of Tanzania, he came in. His leg was bloody, and it was bandaged, and he hobbled over the 400-meter circuit around the track. And all those uh, spectators stood up, and they applauded. Crossing the finish line, he walked off the field without even acknowledging the crowd. And a commentator ran up to him and said, why didn't you just quit? 
he replied, my country did not send me 7,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 7,000 miles to finish it. He didn't have to win. He knew from whom he was running, and that kept him going, even when the logic of the world said, quit. So I ask you again this morning, who are you running for? What is it that keeps you going in the race of life? Chances are, if you're only running for yourself, you'll be tempted to quit in those painful stretches. It's easy to give up. But Jesus has run the race before us. He runs it now with us. He runs with all who will accept his companionship and his help. And thousands and thousands of the great and the small, the famous and the unknown of Christ's people fill the stands. They're cheering us on. They're willing to complete the race that we have started. The race of life, the race of faith. For the glory of God.